Okay, we're, we're all good. We're all good. We're good? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So, so the video is it okay if I go six minutes over? Or should I try to should I try to finish at five thirty, or is it okay if I go to five thirty-six? Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I did. I haven't turned this one on yet. I just turned it on. It's on. It's on. Yeah, yeah, I'll go. It's on now. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Cool. Is it on? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, okay. So we've resolved the recording stuff, so we're good to go. Um, so my name is Arun Thomas, and I'm going to talk about BSD ARM kernel internals. Um, this is my second BSD conference. I gave a talk at Euro BSDCon 2011 uh, a few years ago, and so it's good to be back at another uh, BSD conference. They're always a good time. So. Uh, so let's talk about uh, BSD ARM. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of a quick demo. So this is FreeBSD current running, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago when I built it, and a little bit of debug code. And so you can see it booting. Um, there's some extra debug code, and Witness is on, so it's going to be a little bit slower. Um, so you'll see that there was, a, and I have some screenshots later that'll kind of you can actually see what's going on. But there were a couple versions of uh, U-Boot that ran. Um, the U-Boot loader is uh, running now, and then it's going to load the kernel. So I'll take a couple seconds. OK, here we go. Um, yes, I want to start now. So you've got all this kernel code. It's booting up. It's doing some device stuff. Um, and then shortly, it'll boot up the rest of the way. So, um, so this is kind of I'm going to kind of go through the flow of exactly what's going on. So to get to this point, there was a lot of like machine dependent stuff that needed to happen, and so here you go. You're in user land, and like stuff's happening in the file systems, and pretty soon you get to root pump. So I'm running it off of BeagleBone Black. It's, this is the board here. Um, it's pretty cheap. It's a nice platform. It's supported by all the BSDs that have ARM ports, um, and. It's, so yeah, it'll keep going. And so is this, the or the black? this is the black. I have the white tube. So we're looking at an SSH session from your laptop into there? No, no, this is just, uh, I plugged in the serial. There's a serial cable going right. in. So okay. Adafruit has these handy little cables you can just plug in. So just log in, root, no password. You get the free BSD prompt. So uh, this uses U-Boot, um, so FreeBSD. Um, and it's, I think everyone uses U-Boot on ARM yeah. boards, basically. So that's that. So that's the basic process, and then I'm going to kind of go into like what happens when you're booting up. I'm going to focus on the machine-dependent uh, parts, the machine-independent parts. I don't really talk about it all, but we'll look at some of the code and see what happens. So, all right. So these are a couple of the screenshots, so you can kind of see what happens. So there's a couple versions of U-Boot running. There's, that's one. That's another one, and then. The FreeBSD U-Boot loader runs. And then there's something here about a DTB. It's a device tree blob. I'll talk about what that is. Um, and then you get the copyright notice. Um, before that happens, there's a whole bunch of machine-dependent stuff that needs to happen before you get to this. And uh, I'll talk about, about all that stuff that happens. So you can tell that it's FreeBSD 11 current. And it's got a weird uh, revision because I'm using Git. Um, and it's dirty so because I had some local hacks. Um, host name is imaginatively beastie, and uh, it's the BeagleBone kernel right there. And I'm using Crochet. It's a tool I'll talk about a little bit later to build this uh, image. And it's kind of cool. FreeBSD is built with Clang, and this is running Cortex A8. I'll talk a little bit about the other uh, processors that ARM has, um, all the Cortex processors. Here are some of the features, and then it talks a little bit about caches, and then. This is the uh, system on chip, the SOC, uh, the TI AM3358. And we'll talk a little bit about SOCs and all that stuff, so to, if you're not familiar with ARM. And then there's some more stuff about device tree, and this is basically how the, uh, the UART uh, gets mapped. So this is the memory range, this is the IRQ, and we'll go into all of this. So, um, so the goal of this talk is to get you hacking BSD on ARM. So 
Are there any people here who haven't done any hacking on BS, uh, on any ARM hacking or have done little hacking? Raise your hands. Excellent. So my goal is to get all of you like at least interested in hacking uh, ARM. So that's my goal for this talk. So we'll start off with a little of the ARM 101. So we'll talk a little bit about the basics of the ARM architecture, um, what the assembly looks like, uh, what the system level stuff looks like, various boards that you could buy, um, the SOCs, all that stuff. So just like a quick bootstrap to the ARM architecture. Then we'll go through some of the kernel code. Um, we'll look at uh, NetBSD and FreeBSD. I just picked those because those are the ones I've hacked. But after watching some of the OpenBSD MIPS talks, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get uh, OpenBSD running uh, on ARM. And maybe in an updated version of this talk, I'll add some OpenBSD stuff. Um, so we'll focus on the machine-dependent stuff. How, I won't look at the machine-independent stuff, as I mentioned earlier. So we'll look at how the kernel boots up and does some exception handling and sets up the initial uh, page table and all of that stuff. Um, it'll still be kind of high level, but you can at least, uh, I'll give you at least kind of like the files you want to look at and it's sort of high level so you can dig into more detail later. Um, and then there's a, like a sort of a short section on kind of tips for hacking on BSD ARM and debugging and more resources so you can dig in further because um, I won't be able to get into everything, but there's a lot of good material out there that you can look into. So. There we go. OK, so the ARM architecture. Hugely popular in embedded systems. You probably own several, each of you. Um, it's also moving into general purpose computing. So you've got laptops, desktops, netbooks. Some of the Chromebooks have ARM chips in them. Um, they're pretty nice, actually. Uh, there's servers. Um, HP was making uh, ARM servers at one point. Um, it's also moving into high performance computing. Um, GP, GPU, NVIDIA has some pretty cool SOCs coming out. Uh, and the main reason for this is power efficiency. So it's, it's, a, it's a big push. Um, so ARM has an interesting business model. It doesn't manufacture chips. Um, it basically licenses the architecture and designs to, uh, to various uh, silicon vendors like TI and Samsung and all that stuff. So they basically just come up the architecture and some of the process of design. Someone else will package it up into SOC and fabricate it. OK, so ARM architecture. So it stands for, ARM stands for Advanced Risk Machine. Uh, it used to be Acorn Risk Machine. And since it's a risk machine, it's reduced instruction set computer. It's fewer instructions, simpler instructions. Um, because it's risk, it's load store architecture. So if you want to operate on memory, you have to load it from memory into register, operate it on there, and then store it back out to memory, um, unlike, say, x86, which is not very risky. Um, so it's big Indian or little Indian. Well, little Indian is more common. And so the current versions, there's several versions of the ISA. The current version is uh, ARMv7 and ARMv8. So ARMv7 is 32-bit and ARMv8 is 64-bit. Um, it's ARM, did some cool stuff in ARMv8. They simplified the architecture. But uh, I won't be talking about that at all in this talk. So I'm going to focus uh, purely on ARMv7 and 32-bit. So each of the ISAs also has uh, various architecture profiles. So there's the application profile, the real-time profile, and the microcontroller profile. So I'm only going to talk about the application profile. So the real-time microcontroller profiles are more for uh, embedded systems, and they don't have full uh, MMU support. So, so yeah, as I said, ARM v7a is what we'll talk about. 32-bit ARM processors. Uh, they're called Cortex-A if you're looking at models. Uh, they have full MMU support, and if you look at the ARM documents, they're designed for full feature operating systems. So things like BSD and iOS and stuff like that, not really the kind of like embedded operating systems. So the, uh, the ARM v7a uh, has two instruction sets, actually. So there's the ARM instruction set, and there's the thumb instruction set. So the ARM instruction set is bigger than the, uh, the thumb instruction set. So the thumb instruction set has a mix of 16 and 32-bit instructions, where ARM is just 32-bit. Um, so the 32-bit uh, instructions were added with the, uh, the Thumb 2, um, when they added Thumb 2 technology. Um, so the, the good thing about Thumb is that you get better code density, and that's good for your caches. So all the ARM CPUs are packaged up with other logic into a system on chip or SOC. So you'll hear this SOC acronym a lot. So what's in an SOC? So you have your interrupt controllers, your timers, your UARTs. Um, SDMMC controllers, SATA controllers, USB controllers, GPUs, and all kinds of peripherals. So you might have a camera controller, a GPS controller, all kinds of stuff. You look at all that stuff that goes in your phone, um, it's gonna be on the, the majority is going to be on the SOC. So this 
the SOCs, are, it's actually getting better for the, uh, the ARM developer. So ARM's actually kind of standardized some of, the, some of these things, like the interrupt controller and the timers. Before, each SOC vendor would basically create their own set of timers and their own set of interrupt controllers. So it made it kind of hard for uh, uh, OS developers since they had to write all these new drivers. But now ARM has this generic interrupt controller and generic timers, so it makes it a little bit easier. ARM's kind of building a platform. OK, so this is what an SOC looks like. This is the AM335X SOC. Uh, this is the SOC that's in the, uh, the Beagle Bone, black. Um, so you see that the, uh, there's, the core is actually a small part of the SOC. There's a lot of other stuff in there. So you've got a GPU it's here, and you've got a whole bunch of various buses. You've got the UART, SPI, I2C stuff, timers, real-time clock, ADCs, and then you've got your GPIOs. And so there's a whole bunch of like logic on there. Um, including USB and an Emacs. So the SOC has a whole bunch of stuff in addition to the core. So as I mentioned, I'm using Beagle One Black. It can be yours for the low, low price of $45 US. It's a popular hobbyist board, and it's supported by FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD. And uh, Dragonfly, I don't think, has an ARM port, as far as I know. And, but I imagine if it did, it would support it as well. So it's kind of a cool little board. It has a lot of I.O. Another popular board is the BeagleBoard XM. It's a little more expensive. It's supported by FreeBSD and a branch for uh, Google Summer of Code. I don't think it was integrated um, back, but may sometime. Uh, NetBSD supports it. OpenBSD supports it. And the nice thing about this board is if you don't want to buy it, QMU, Lenora's version of QMU actually has a support for it. So you could just boot it up in a virtual machine. So that's kind of cool. OK, so this is a bunch of different SOCs. Um, and these are all supported by, and the boards that are associated with them. And these are all supported by one of the BSDs. Um, so the top is uh, the OMAP 3, OMAP 4, the DaVinci, and Citara. They're all from uh, Texas Instruments, and they're kind of a family of SOCs. It's fairly similar. So you've got the Beagle Board, and the Beagle Board, and there's a couple versions of the Beagle Board. There's a couple versions of the Beagle Bone, like the gentleman over there was talking about the uh, Beagle Bone white versus black. I have the black here. Um, and Panda Board has a couple versions too. So these are really popular uh, developer boards. Uh, then you have the All Winner A10 and A20 that's using the QB board and the QB truck. Also a fairly popular board, especially now. Uh, the Freescale IMX6 is in the WAN board. Uh, the Samsung Exynos 5 is in the Chromebook and the Arndale board. That's a really high end uh, SOC um, with a really high end ARM processors in them. So the last one's actually really interesting. So the Xilinx Zinc has a uh, these Cortex chips packaged up with some FPGA logic. So if you want to do any hardware design, it's a pretty cool platform. So these boards range from 45 to like 400, 500. I forget exactly. The Z board's the most expensive board. Um, the Micro Z, I think, is fairly cheap. So if you want to play around with that, it's pretty cool. So this is all of the Cortex CPUs. Um, so on the low end, you have the, the Cortex A5, the Freescale Vibrid is uh, an SOC that supports the A5. That's for really kind of like embedded stuff. Um, the Cortex-A8 is more popular. You'll see that in most of these uh, developer boards that are out. So the OMAP 3 SOC, DaVinci, Citara, so your Beagle boards, Beagle Bones, have this uh, chip in there. So it's, it's lower end. Uh, and they all winner A10. So the Cortex-A9 is sort of the mid-range CPU. You'll find in the OMAP 4, the Freescale MX6, and the Xilinx Zinc. So this is what's in the Panda board. Uh, the Cortex A15 is the high end. As I mentioned, it's in the Exynos 5. You'll find it in a lot of the high end phones and in the, the, uh, the Chromebook. So the A7 is actually a replacement for the A8. So it's found in the Exynos 5 and the All Winner A20. So it'll eventually like, fully replace it. And the A12 and A17 are mid range CPUs. So they'll replace the, uh, the A9 over time. And I don't know what SOCs they're in. But I'm sure they'll be in a lot of SSCs. Maybe some of you know. Um, so it's sort of, there's a lot of CPUs, so it's hard to kind of keep track of them all. But uh, typically, the, the one you'll see a lot is the A8 and A9 for the developer boards that you'll see. So now that we've talked a little bit about the boards and the hardware, I'll talk a little bit about the software. So ARM has several versions of ABIs. And so an ABI is an application binary interface. So the ARM docs, uh, the quote is that they are rules that an ARM executable must adhere to. So things like executable formats, calling conventions, alignment, uh, 
what system calls look like, all that kind of stuff is uh, set aside in the ABI. So there's several ARM ABIs. Uh, there's the ARM eABI, the ARM embedded ABI, and there's the ARM eABI HF, or that's the ARM embedded ABI with hardware floating point. Uh, so those are kind of like the current ABIs. The, there's also the ARM OABI, and I don't actually know what it stands for. Maybe old, I don't know, but it's sort of obsolete, but it's used for older versions of ARM. Does anybody know what OABI stands for? No? Okay, just wondering. Uh, so NetBSD and FreeBSD both support uh, EABI and EB, EABI HF. So when you're building this stuff, you wanna make sure you have the right tool chain. Uh, so you want a tool chain that's built for EABI or e, EABI. E A B I H F, depending on what you want. Okay, so let's look a little bit into what the uh, the architecture looks like. So the ARM has 16 general purpose registers. Um, some of them have uh, are used for other things or have kind of dedicated uses. So the frame pointer R11 is the frame pointer. R13 is the stack pointer. R14 is the link register. Um, so when you do a call instruction, the link register will save your current PC. So if something to go back to, so that's the link register. Um, and the program counter is R15. So ARM also has some program status registers. Uh, there's also a floating point, uh, they're called VF, it's a VFP instructions, and SIMD, that's the, uh, the NEON instruction uh, set. I won't really talk about those. Um, but if you're doing like, high, like vector code or GPU code or that kind of stuff, it'll be uh, useful to you. Uh, so in terms of this, ARM has these two program status registers that are fairly important when you're doing systems code. So there's the current program status register, the CPSR, and the saved program status register, uh, the SPSR, which is used for exceptions. Uh, and it holds a number of important bits, like the processor mode. Uh, for instance, SVC is a mode, and we'll talk about what the different modes are soon. Uh, the interrupt mask bit, so if you want to disable interrupts, you'll uh, set this IRQ bit. ARM versus thumb state. Um, Andianness is a big Indian, little Indian, and various condition flags. So here's what the assembly syntax looks like. Um, this will just add two numbers together. It'll add one plus two. So you move one into R1, you move two into R2, then you add R1 and R2 and put in R3. So the destination is on the left. So that's a basic intro to data operations on ARM. So the memory instructions, as I mentioned, it's a load store architecture. So if you want to work on stuff in memory, uh, you have to use the LDR, the load, and the store STR instruction. So you want to move what R1 points to into R0, and then you want to store um, R0 into what R1 points to. Um, there's also push and pop instructions that'll push multiple registers onto the stack and pop multiple registers off the stack. So these are actually aliases for ARM has these instructions, LDM, load multiple, and STM, store multiple. Um, they're the same thing with, if you have the right uh, suffix and whatnot. And control flow. So ARM, of course, has control flow. So uh, this is branch of zero. So BZ loop, um, expect. And the call instruction is the, is the BL branch link instruction. And so this will label. And so this will save the current PC to the, uh, to the link register. If you're gonna do a return, it's a BXLR, so branch exchange with the link register. It'll just jump back to whatever's in the LR. And in older versions of the ISA, this is how you do it. You just move the LR into the PC. Um, that's, I think, deprecated in ARM v7, but it still works. So I just uh, don't recommend it, especially if you're doing thumb stuff. Um, okay, so that's kind of like the application level stuff. So let's look into the OS relevant bits because that's what we're doing. We're trying to get a the OS going. So there are uh, two, well, there's actually more than this, but the two privilege levels that we care about are PL0 and PL1. So PL0 is unprivileged user code. PL1 is privileged kernel code. Uh, that's what it's used for. And there are nine operating modes. So there's one unprivileged user mode that runs at PL0, and there's eight privileged modes that we'll talk about, um, and they run at PL1 and above. So the privileged modes are used mostly for exception and interrupt handling. So it's a little bit complicated, and ARMv8 cleans some of this stuff up, but if you're gonna be doing uh, kernel programming, especially like at this level, it's good to know how this stuff works. So here are the various modes. Um, there's supervisor mode, which handles, which is used for system calls, and it's also the initial mode that the, uh, the processor starts up in. 
is interrupt mode for normal interrupts, fast interrupt mode for higher priority interrupts, and they're a bit faster as well, um, as you might expect from the name. Uh, there's abort mode for memory faults, undefined mode for illegal instructions. You can also use this to emulate instructions in software. Uh, system mode, which is a privileged mode for user mode registers. We don't, it doesn't really get used that much. Uh, hypervisor mode for VMM support, and monitor mode for trust zone. The modes that you really, that we'll really care about are supervisor mode, interrupt mode, abort mode, and undefined mode. Um, those are the ones that typically get used. Um, so there's one kind of interesting feature of the architecture. There's a thing called banked registers. And it's a little bit complicated, but it's good to know about. Um, so most registers are shared across all the modes. Um, so you have one PC that applies for all the modes. But there are some registers that are dedicated for each mode. So you can have, and so there are duplicate registers for each of these modes. So there's a separate stack for each mode, so, you can, so you're going to want to have separate stack pointers. So there's a stack pointer for user mode, a stack pointer for, for a supervisor mode, for instance. And the CPU will automatically set the appropriate banked register um, depending on what mode you're in. So in user mode, the CPU knows that you want the, uh, the user mode stack pointer. In SVC mode, the CPU knows you want the uh, SVC uh, stack pointer. So why do they add this stuff? So it's important for exception handling. So basically, we want to know how do we get back to the, uh, the faulting instruction. So we need to, to do that, we need to save the, uh, the state at the time of the exception. So the bank link register, um, so usually the link register saves the, uh, the PC when you do a call. Here it'll save the, uh, the program counter at exception time. Um, and the saved program status register will save the, uh, the current program status register at exception time. So that basically saves your state. So for instance, if you're doing a system call, LRSVC and SPRSVC, the link register in SVC mode and the SPSR register in SVC mode, save the program counter and the current program status at the time of the SVC exception, so from the user code. So typically, when the processor changes modes, it'll do that kind of automatically on an exception. So when interrupt triggers, it'll switch to IRQ mode on SVC instructions, also called SWI, or software interrupt. If you look through the BSD code, this is actually the name that gets used. Um, but uh, if you look at the newer ARM docs, they tell you everything uses SVC, because I guess that's, that's sort of the new name for uh, uh, the supervisor call or system call instruction. So the SVC instruction will switch to SVC mode. Um, so that's basically how it works. Each exception, you go to the, uh, the, the, the according mode. Um, so the OS can also change the mode using the privileged CPS instruction. So that's the change processor state instruction. So the CPS instruction, basically what it does is it modifies the mode field in the CPSR. So this is basically, you'll find this in when we talk a little bit later about uh, what the instruction, what the kind of early boot code looks like in FreeBSD and NetBSD. Um, it'll do this. So this is how you switch to SVC mode if you want to use the CPS instruction. And if you want to switch to SVC mode and disable interrupts, this is the SVC mode. And you use the, uh, the suffix ID, which is interrupt disable. And you tell it which bits, the IRQ bit and the fast IRQ uh, bit. So back to the status registers. Um, so if you'll recall, these hold the current mode, the interrupt disable, and endianness. Um, this is how you read and write them. So this is if you want to read the CPSR, and if you want to, read the SP if you want to write the SPSR, it looks like this. So the instructions are a little bit confusing. So it's move to register from status is read. And then write is move to status from register. So these are in the docs, and you'll get used to them. But there is a gotcha here. And actually, uh, this was fixed in FreeBSD a couple months ago. Um, so there's, if you don't give the FSXC suffix, which basically lays out each of the parts of the status to write, um, you might not, the, uh, the compiler or the assembler won't necessarily do the right thing. So there's an off a suffix underscore all, and it doesn't actually mean all. So depending on the version of gas you use, uh, bad things can happen. So there was this bug with a, uh, it was called the wrong Indian register restore bug. And so this was because um, all didn't really mean all. So, and if you're interested, you can look into the, uh, the revision ID, but it was kind of an interesting bug that was fixed. And I think it took a long time for, uh, I think it was in Lepore fixed it, so tricky. So a quick overview of ARM virtual memory. Uh, it's 32-bit address um, on ARM v7. Uh, 
ARMv8, of course, is 64-bit, and uh, if you use LPA8, it's actually 40 bits, but we'll talk about the 32-bit uh, the ARMv7 stuff. So with that, you get a four gigabyte virtual address space, um, and there's paging support, two levels of page tables. Um, the TLBs are hardware managed, so the MMU will do the page table walk and a TLB miss. Uh, the commonly used page sizes are 4KB small page sizes and one megabyte sections. And if you want to know more, a lot more about ARM virtual memory, there's a talk about uh, transparent super pages tomorrow, so you should go check that out. You'll learn a lot more about uh, virtual memory because um, I'm just covering the basics. Okay, so the other kind of key thing in the architecture is coprocessor 15. So if you're doing kernel hacking, you're going to have to look at this. So it's a system control coprocessor. Coprocessor is a little bit of a misleading term because it's actually an integral part of the architecture. You can't really take it out. But so it's heavily used for systems programming, and it's used for things like setting up the processes page table. So this is how you write the, uh, the page table to the uh, translation table base register. So it's an MCR instruction, move to coprocessor from register. And it's a little, it's, I don't know, it doesn't, you have to read the docs to figure out exactly like which uh, numbers to put in there and stuff. So um, Usually these things are wrapped up in inline assembly, so that makes it a little bit easier. Um, the other important thing this does, it holds the system control register. So the system control register allows you to enable the MMU, the branch predictor, caching, and it tells you where to put the exception. Tell, it allows the OS to tell the CPU where, to put, where the exception vectors will go. So yeah, reading MRC, writing MCR, so move to coprocessor from register. And yeah, this stuff is in the docs, but it's, it takes a little getting used to. I, I kept screwing it up, but uh, you, maybe you guys will be faster. Um, so this is probably the most important slide in the, in the whole presentation. So this is where you go to get more information about ARM. So I'm just going to kind of like touch some of the basics. This is where you go. So yeah, there's, this is a quote from the NetBSD code, and I'll read it out. It's, uh, and thus spake the ARM ARM. So what's the ARM ARM? It's the ARM architecture reference manual. And so that is all the details about the instruction set architecture. It's 2,000 pages, so you, or almost 2,000 pages. So you're probably not going to read it cover to cover, but it has it'll answer all of the questions you have about the ARM architecture. So you want the the ARM v7a and ARM v7r edition of that. Um, if you want kind of a a quicker kind of a lighter introduction to ARM, the ARM Cortex, Cortex A series programmers guide is really nice. It came out a couple of years ago, and they just updated it for this year. Um, and in the latest revision, they really updated and expanded a lot of the discussion. So you should, if you're interested in ARM, you should download that like now. Um, both of these are free, and it does require registration on the ARM website, but they're free. So the other thing, the other resource that's good is the ARM System Developers Guide. This is actually a printed book, and it's from 2004, so it's about a, de it's a, de it's about a decade ago. Um, and ARM moves pretty fast, so it's definitely dated. But if you want to really dig into like kind of like the systems level, kernel stuff, like exactly exceptions work and some of that stuff. It's a, it's a good resource. Um, in addition to the core ARM docs, you'll also want to look at the manuals for your processor, your SOC, and your board. So for the, uh, the Beagle board, it's a Cortex-A8. You want to look at the Cortex-A8 TRM uh, for the, um, or sorry, the BeagleBone as well. And then for the BeagleBone, uh, you want to look at the AM335X TRM. And then you'll want to look at the system reference manual for that. And it'll give you stuff basically like uh, rough, the device map. So for the Beagle on black, these are some of the key addresses that you need to know. 44E09000 is where the UART is. If you write to the address, you can write to the UART. The interrupt controller is at this address. The timer, DM timer 1's clock is at this address. And the RAM's at this address. So you'll want to look at your TRM to figure out exactly how to uh, set up your board. Um, ARM also has several migration guides. So for the folks who are coming from x86 or MIPS or Power, these are really good guides. Um, and I even if you're just kind of interested in computer architecture, um, this is kind of cool. So I saw some MIPS talks today. So I'm thinking about reading the MIPS to ARM guide, except I'm going to go from maybe from ARM to MIPS uh, as well. Um, so the IA32 guide has. Uh, like, for instance, it tells you about a gotcha with the fact that uh, characters are unsigned by default and that can cause problems. So there's a lot of useful tips in there. OK. So that's kind of a quick introduction to the uh, ARM architecture. Um, there's a lot of material, but as I said, there's a lot of guides that you can look into to get more details.
So now we'll start digging into the code a bit. So I think George Neville Neal calls this code splunking in his uh, ACM uh, columns. So we're going to start, uh, start digging. So the vast majority of the OS code um, is machine independent. But we're basically just going to dig into the machine dependent code, so the ARM code. So that's a mix of C and some assembly and some inline assembly. So that's why we quickly went over the assembly syntax earlier. And we'll see examples from FreeBSD and NetBSD. And by time, there would have been OpenBSD here, too. OK, so FreeBSD and NetBSD ARM both have great ARM support. There's a few uh, notable differences, or at least they're interesting differences to me. So NetBSD has this build.sh strip that's used for cross-building. And it allows for cross-OS building, which is kind of cool. So you can build from your Mac or your Linux machine. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, FreeBSD uses Clang even on ARM to build the system. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, FreeBSD uses something called Device Tree for hardware configuration, uh, while NetBSD uses the Autoconf framework. Um, FreeBSD also has an extra bootloader stage that you saw when we booted up. So these are the key directories that you're going to want to look at if you want to dig into the code some more. So these are the include directories. And so it's interesting that this is ARM32 directory. You might think that happened like when ARM v8 was added. But it turns out ARM had a 26-bit version of the architecture a long time ago. So there's like 26-bit ARM support in some of the NetBSD files. Um, and then these files are basically where you get the kind of core, like the, the source files. ARM, ARM32, and Cortex. So in terms of the, uh, the SOC and the BeagleBoard, you want to look at the OMAP directory. And the EBB ARM, which stands for Evaluation Board ARM, is where the kind of platform board-specific stuff goes. So all your BeagleBoard uh, uh, machine dev code goes there. So the configuration files you want to look at, uh, the files.arm file tells you which files the, uh, will get built for the ARM port. And the files are Cortex file also adds to that. STD.arm is the uh, kind of like build options. So you look at this stuff for the, uh, the core files. And then the, uh, the BeagleBone and the SFC files, you look at the OMAP2, the EBB arm, the Beagle. And this is the, uh, the kernel config file, the top level config file that will uh, uh, pull in the rest of the stuff. So FreeBSD is similar. Um, it actually has fewer paths to look at. So you look at the sysarm include and sysarm arm. So that's the, uh, the headers in the source for the FreeBSD ARM uh, core support. And then for the SOC and the Beagle, you look at the TI uh, directory. That's shared code for all the, uh, the TI family of SOCs. And then you look at the AM335X uh, directory for the, the stuff that's specific to the Beagle. And then you've got the configuration file. These are the files that are for the core ARM support, sysconf. And then you've got the, uh, the Beagle stuff, so the TI family of SOC files. AM335X, the BeagleBone, and this is the top level uh, config file. So if you want to dig into that stuff more, you'll kind of read through those files and see what's going on. So it'll tell you exactly what's getting built. So let's talk a little bit about bootloaders. So I mean, what you saw earlier when I booted up, there was a lot of different bootloaders that happened. And so we'll kind of go through what happens there. So at a high level, what the bootloader does is it does sort of low level hardware initialization. So DRAM and serial. It'll pass and boot parameters to the kernel, and it'll load the kernel. So I mean, that sounds simple, but it actually does a lot under the hood. So, but at a high level, this is what it does. So when you boot up, the first thing that happens is that the reset handler in the SOC ROM runs. And the first stage bootloader will run. So that's MLO or sometimes or SPL. Um, it's a stripped down version of uBoot that runs, and it's needed since the, uh, the DRAM isn't initialized. So this is kind of the output from there. And so you can tell that it's reading the, uh, the uBoot image. So then uBoot will run, and that will read the uh, configuration from the un.txt. So you can see that here. And then it'll run the, uh, the uBoot loader on FreeBSD. It doesn't do this on NetBSD. And also read this device tree blob that we'll talk about a little bit later. So then the third, stu the third stage bootloader runs, um, again, only on, NetBSD, on FreeBSD, rather. Um, and this is an implementation of loader 8. Um, which is the loader for other architectures as well. Um, and it'll read the loader.conf configuration. And then it'll load the, uh, the FreeBSD kernel. So you can kind of see that happening here. And it's going to use that device tree blob. And if you're interested in what the sources are doing, that's where you go. So device tree. 
Um, this used by FreeBSD on several platforms. I think it came from PowerPC originally. Um, and basically what it is is a data structure that describes hardware configuration. So all the device tree sources are in this uh, directory, sysboot, FDT, DTS, ARM. Uh, for the Beagle on Black, you'll want to look at these files, the Beagle on Black.dts and the am335x.dtsi. So that's an include file uh, that the Beagle on Black DTS uh, includes. So most of the logic is actually in here. Um, so this is the configuration for the serial port. So the SOC is the, AC, the AM335X, and the serial port is at this address, which we saw earlier when I mentioned the, uh, the device map. So it's 44E09000. Uh, it tells you what kind of uh, serial port it is, uh, where the, the address range, um, the reg register shift, so it's uh, word four byte access. 32-bit, uh, um, and then which interrupts and clock frequency and other stuff. So FreeBSD, um, so that DTS file that we just showed, there was a fragment from that. It'll go, the device tree compiler will take that and, and uh, turn it into a blob. And so that becomes the bbbone black.ttb for the beaglebone black. And it's stored in a compressed format called flattened device tree. So the blob can either be compiled into the kernel or the UB loader can load it. Um, in this case, when we saw the, the output earlier, what's happening is the UB loader is actually uh, loading it separately. It's not built into the kernel. And so once that happens, the kernel will parse the DTB to learn the, the board's hardware configuration. And libftd handles the parsing, in case you're curious on how that stuff works. So NetBSD doesn't use device tree. It uses uh, autoconf, the, uh, the device auto configuration framework. Um, Basically what happens is uh, the hardware config info is generated by the kernel configuration process when config 8 runs. And so this is an example of that from the, uh, the BeagleBones uh, kernel configuration. So this is the same uh, UART uh, configuration. You can tell the same address that we saw earlier, 44E09000. And the size is the same, so it's the same range, the same interrupt, and the, the register shift to four, or here these multiple. So it's just a different way to represent this information. So at a high level, so we've talked a little bit about bootloaders. At a high level, um, we'll talk about uh, kernel initialization. So the early kernel initialization is basically um, just kind of like the low-level device stuff. So this is kind of what, mostly what we'll be talking about in the coming examples. So the first thing it does, it'll save off the boot parameters. It'll set an initial page table and enable the MMU. Then it'll set up the exception vector table, the exception handlers, and the exception stacks. Then I'll do some initializing of the devices, like the serial, the interrupt controller, the timers for the clock tick. Then you'll get into your machine-independent initialization, um, initialize various kernel subsystems, more device initialization. Then you'll enable interrupts and then switch to user mode and run init. So that's kind of like at a high level. But we'll focus mostly on kind of like the early kernel initialization and the machine-dependent stuff. So this is, these are the very first instructions that FreeBSD runs um, when you boot ARM. Uh, so it's in sysarm arm lo core.s. So this is shared with all of the uh, ARM SOCs. So you can tell that, um, so it uses the Linux boot API, or at least that's one of the options. There's some if defs around this code. Um, so in R0, you put uh, zero. Um, R1 gets the machine type, which gets passed in at ARM. And R2 gets the, uh, the DTB image pointer. Um, so the first thing that this code does is that it will save off these parameters. Um, the comment tells us that it gets put in ARM boot params and eventually passed in it ARM. And the next thing it does is that it will tr make sure that interrupts are disabled. Typically, U-boot does this for you, but it's good to do it anyways, uh, just to make sure. So NetBSD, um, it's fairly similar. Um, it, the, each, uh, each SOC, each board has a, a separate start routine. So that's a little bit different than FreeBSD. So there's a Beagle start routine that, uh, that will be used on NetBSD as opposed to a common uh, start routine on FreeBSD. Um, so the first thing it does is that it'll switch to SVC mode and it'll disable interrupts. Um, so similar to FreeBSD, um, except it also does the, uh, the mode switch. U-Boot should already uh, put this processor in SVC mode, so this probably isn't necessary, but it's good to make sure. 
Um, it also will save off the various uh, parameters um, that it got from the bootloader. Um, that's what this STMI A thing is. That's basically a store multiple. And the move W, move T thing, it doesn't really matter. It's basically because uh, ARM can't do 32-bit uh, immediate loads. So that's how you do that. But uh, basically what it does is it's saving off the parameters it got from the bootloader. So I'll continue walking through what NetBSD does as it boots up. Uh, FreeBSD is pretty similar, and I'll talk about the kind of similarities. NetBSD has a little bit more kind of like, there's sort of more branching, so I, that's part of the reason why I went with that one, so you can kind of follow through. Um, so the next thing that it's gonna do is that it's going to set up the page table. So BeagleStar calls this arm boot l one pt init function, and so that sets up an initial page table. And so this is an L1 page table uh, with one megabyte sections. And basically all it does is it identity maps the kernel. So virtual address equals physical address. Um, and then also map the serial. It also have a mapping for serial. So you can uh, get your debug output to the, uh, to the UART. Um, so once, that, once it sets that up, it'll call ARM CPU init. And ARM CPU init is what, if you read the comment, is what turns on the MMU and caches. So the ARM CPU init function can be found in this directory. So it's a little bit misleading because it says it's an A9 uh, function, but it's running on a Cortex A8, but the code's actually the same. So, um, and what, basically what this does is it invalidates the caches and TLDs, and it'll also, after it does that, it'll enable the caches, it'll set the translation table base register, and then it'll enable the MMU. Okay, so once that happens, the, uh, the Beagle Start routine will jump to start in uh, locore.s. And this is actually a, a shared routine across all the ARM uh, boards. And uh, so the ARM SOC will, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the branch to start. And so start, what it does is basically sets up the environment for C code. So up until this point, all, everything you've seen is assembly code. And so once that's done, start can call init arm, which is the first C code that runs. Init arm will call init arm common. So init arm is actually a board specific, and there's an init arm common, which is actually shared across all the boards. Um, so after that happens, after init arm runs and init arm common runs, start will return back to Beagle start, and then you can call main, which is the first machine independent code. So this is actually fairly similar to how FreeBSD boots as well, except main, I think, is MI startup. And then there is also an init arm function that does all the kind of like heavy lifting to do the, uh, to set up the, uh, the processor and all that stuff. So here's what init arm looks like, or what it does basically. Um, so as I mentioned, init arm is SOC specific. You can find it in Beagle MacDep or MashDep, I don't know. Um, and then the init arm common is arm generic. You can find in the arm32, arm32 boot.c. And so it performs all the logic needed before main runs. So it'll set up the CPU func structure to the, for the basic CPU functions. So for the right, in, for in this case, for the arm to the arm v7 uh, CPU functions. It'll map the devices and initialize the console. It'll set up a real page table and switch to it. There's a lot of code that, to do that. And then it'll also set up the exception vectors and stacks. And finally, it'll also parse the boot uh, arguments that it got from uBoot. So once an init arm runs, um, you get back to uh, Beagle start, and then main runs. And that's the machine independent code, which we won't really talk about, but it's pretty interesting. And there was a B Asia BSD con talk about that that I'll reference later if you want to learn about how all that stuff works. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about exception handling since we kind of went through the, uh, the machine dependent code. So basically as a kernel hacker, what you have to do is you have to set up the vector table, you have to set up the exception stack pointers, and then you have to write handlers for each exception. So here are the various exceptions that you have. You have the reset, undefined instructions, supervisor call for the SVC or SWI, prefetch board and data board, those are memory faults. Um, interrupt, fast interrupt, uh, hypervisor call uh, for the HVC instruction. So the exception vector table is a jump table with eight entries, uh, one for each exception type. So each entry holds one ARM instruction. So that instruction can either be a branch to an exception handler or a PC load of the exception handler. And so that's what that looks like. 
and there. So this is FreeBSD's exception vector table, and you can find that in arm exception.s, so it's shared code. Um, so basically all this does is it, it's basically a branch instruction. So you've got one for each of the various uh, fault handlers. So you're gonna figure out exactly what the, uh, the system call handler is doing. You look in SWI entry and see what that does. So the OS has to tell the processor where the exception vector table is. There's a few options. So you can put it at address zero or address zero X FF FF zero 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 zero. It's kind of the high vectors and where zero is the low vectors. And this is set based on the, uh, the system control registers V bit. You can also use the, uh, in ARMv7, the vector base address register to program the, uh, where the vector table uh, goes. And NetBSD actually has an option for this if you want to do that. Um, so I think it supports all of these options, actually, depending on which config, uh, which if def uh, you go through. So this is what FreeBSD's uh, exception setup code looks like. Um, NetBSD's is also similar. But so as I mentioned, FreeBSD has an, an it arm function. And so what it'll do is it'll allocate stacks for each of the modes. So as I mentioned earlier, there's only a few modes that are really important to us. So there's the IRQ stack for interrupts, the abort stack for memory faults, the undefined stack for undefined instructions, and the kernel stack, which is used in uh, SVC mode. Um, so once you've allocated all the stacks, you want to set the stack pointer for each of the modes. As I mentioned, there's those bank uh, registers. So you have to go into each mode and set up the stack pointers for each of these um, for IRQ mode, abort mode, undefined mode, and SVC mode. So once you do that, you will do call arm vector init. And you can tell, so it's arm vectors high, so it's that 0x ff ff 0, 0, 0, 0 address. And this will set up the, uh, the vectors uh, that should go into. OK. So that's kind of like a high level overview of how um, the machine dependent code uh, works on a BSD, um, specifically NetBSD and FreeBSD. So there's a lot more stuff that happens in the machine dependent code or independent code. Some of the machine independent code is going to call into uh, machine dependent stuff, like if you need to save context or switch and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's kind of like the overall stuff. So if you look at the other functions, if you follow the, each of the exceptions through, you can kind of look into how that stuff works. So now we'll get into a few um, kind of practical things about developing BSD and ARM. So BSD has actually really good cross compilation support. So it's kind of cool because you can cross build the whole system. You've got the, uh, the tool chain, the user land, all of that stuff. It's all built in, so it's kind of nice. Um, you don't have to do that stuff yourself. Um, you can also create bootable SD images. Um, it's a project called Crochet uh, for FreeBSD, and it makes it really easy to create these uh, bootable SD images for these various boards. Um, you can also use build.sh on NetBSD um, to do the same thing. Um, when I was building for the Beagle One Black, I used the eARM v7 HF ABI, but you can choose whatever ABI makes sense to you. Um, one important thing here is that if you use this stuff, it'll give you the right version of U-Boot. Um, if you have an old version of U-Boot or a different version of U-Boot, um, it can be incompatible with your kernel. So sometimes I'd run, I don't know, a different version of U-Boot or the U-Boot that came with a board, and sometimes um, the kernel wouldn't boot or panic or something. So. If you use this method where you just use the, uh, the U-boot that came with the, uh, the crochet image or the, the build of SH image, you'll have an easier time. If you don't want to go through the, the hassle of building the image, you can also grab snapshots off the uh, like NetBSD and FreeBSD mirror. Um, so if you don't want to deal with burning SD images, you can also NetBoot. So you can TFT boot the kernel. You can NFS mount the root file system. So, if you, if you get tired of building SD images, that's one thing you can do. Um, you might, it might keep you from uh, spending a lot of money on SD cards if you burn them out, if you keep uh, re-imaging them. So, okay, so a few tips on debugging BSD ARM. So one of the things you wanna do is get printf as early as possible. So U-boot uh, usually will initialize a serial for you. So if you write to that address, the right, uh, the THR register um, at that 4x, 44E9 address, you can get stuff out to the UART. Um, so 
If you want to see early debug output, you can turn on verbose init arm on NetBSD. And there's debug, uh, there's a debug macro in FreeBSD's uh, machine, or macdep.c. So that stuff's good. So it's good to see all that stuff come out in the console. Another thing that's useful is a, a, JTAG, a JTAG debugger. Um, some are actually like kind of affordable, like the fly swatter, and some are very, very expensive. So um, you might need your company to buy it or something, but the fly swatter is sort of reasonable. But it's kind of useful so you can like single step when you're doing kind of like low level board stuff. And especially if you're doing work with U-boot, then you, know, you really want a JTAG debugger. Uh, kernel debugger is also useful. Um, DDB, it's nice to be able to have that as a debugging facility. Uh, QMU is also great. So you can actually hack on ARM without having any ARM hardware. Um, you need some hardware. You need to at least have a laptop, but you don't need any ARM hardware. Um, so Lenora's version of QMU has BeagleBoard XM support, and mainline QMU has QBboard support. And the nice thing about this is that you can add debugs. You can add debug code to your hardware. So it's kind of cool. And you can look at the code to figure out exactly like what is the ARM processor doing when, I don't know, exceptions happen. So um, it's kind of nice if you don't want to dig through the ARM, uh, ARM. So there are a lot of talks on various uh, ARM and embedded topics. Um, these are all from various BSD con talks. So how FreeBSD boots is great. Um, it goes through all the machine dependent and machine independent stuff. Um, it focuses on MIPS, most of it's generic. It even mentions ARM in some places. So that's worth reading if you want to get some more information. Uh, NetBSD on the, Mar the Marvell or Mod XP is great if you want to learn more about how to get NetBSD running on a modern uh, kind of ARM SOC. FreeBSD and NetBSD on the APM um, is actually about PowerPC, but it's an interesting comparison about how, how you port on FreeBSD versus NetBSD. So there's a lot of comparisons there that was kind of interesting. Uh, FreeBSD on latest ARM processors, uh, EABA tool, tool chain. That's a lot of interesting stuff about the new ABIs and the tool chain support and how that uh, happened. If you want to learn more about flattened device tree, that's a good talk. Um, and then interfacing FreeBSD with U-Boot goes through all of the booting stuff in much more detail and talks a lot more about U-Builder. And I think maybe it was built, or it, this talk kind of coincided with the creation of that. I'm not sure. Porting NetBSD to a new ARM SOC, porting NetBSD to a new ARM SOC is a, it's it's actually kind of an older document. It's just a web page of a presentation, but it goes into like really heavy detail on how to get up a new SOC. So some of it's dated, but it has sort of the most complete information. So if you want to like port a new board, then that's where you'd go to. And these are all good, uh, really good presentations and overviews. So you should check them out if you want to do more uh, hacking. And as I said, there's a couple cool ARM talks tomorrow, transparent super pages for FreeBSD on ARM, and FreeBSD and BeagleBone Black, a robotic application. As I mentioned, this is the same board that uh, the presenter will be using, and I imagine he'll have probably a cooler demo than I did. So all I did was boot up FreeBSD. So, so in summary, we uh, discussed sort of the basics of the ARM architecture, uh, went into all the kind of like system level aspects. I kind of gave you guys a shopping list of all the boards you could get. You could try to collect them all if you want. Um, it'll be kind of expensive, but you could do it. Um, and then sort of what the assembly looks like and all the system level aspects. So, and I also gave you the resources, so you should definitely grab the Cortex-A Programmer's Guide and the ARM ARM. Um, then we looked at some of the machine dependent BSD code. We kind of walked through what boot looks like. Um, sort of at a high level, but at the very least, you know which files to look at. And you can kind of dig in a little bit more with CScope or Global or whatever we, whatever you use or C tags um, to figure out exactly what, what happens because there is a lot more detail there. I kind of went over it a fairly high level. And then there were a couple tips and further resources I added for uh, BSD hacking on ARM. So definitely the crochet tool is really great and build this age is great if you want to just build images. But if you do a lot of hacking, definitely MFS and TFT boot is, is a good way to go. So I want to thank all the BSD developers, especially all the ARM folks. Um, there were a lot of really useful uh, posts on the various mailing lists. And most of the developers have blogs, so there's a lot of really good information on there. And I found that really useful when I was kind of getting up to speed on this stuff. And so if you just kind of like Google something like, you'll probably come across one of the developers' blogs. So it's, uh, it's good stuff out there. So I'm hoping, so it's a lot of information. It was kind of like drinking from a fire hose. But uh, I hope that I gave you guys at least some interest and in at least foundation so you can kind of start hacking on, hacking on ARM for yourself. <laughs>
Um, so you could just grab some hardware off the shopping list and a BSD of your choice. And then you could like, some of the things that you could do, you could port to a new board or add driver support or fix some bugs. Um, I know that FreeBSD is uh, working towards becoming an R a tier one, making ARM a tier one architecture. And there was a wiki page about like things they wanted done so you could help out with that. NetBSD, NetBSD and OpenBSD are always looking for more driver support and board support. Um, if you're feeling really enterprising, you could port Dragonfly to ARM. I think one of the uh, developers is actually uh, an ARM employee, so maybe you could talk to him. Actually, I think that would be cool, so some of those things I would be interested in. Um, another one would be uh, getting VigaBoard XM support in the mainline for FreeBSD, that would be cool. Uh, Crochet had, I think there was a wish list item on there. I think when you build a Crochet image, you have to do it as root, so there was like a thread on that, so you could help out with that. But there's a lot of stuff you can do. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot more development happening on Linux on ARM just because it's like a big ecosystem. But there's a lot happening on BSD too, and you could be a part of it. So, if you have any, if you have any questions about ARM and you want to talk to me, I'll be around and you can email me. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so I'm using this uh, cable from uh, Adafruit. Um, if you go there after the talk, I can show you where to get it. So it's, I don't know, it's like a 10 buck cable or something. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Sure. Uh, we can talk afterwards and other people who know how to talk to the patient want to talk to you. Oh, okay. Definitely. Sounds good. Another question that's sort of a Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, a lot of that stuff's kind of dependent on like the configuration stuff. So some of the stuff's going to be uh, just specific to your specific. So there's ARM generic stuff, there's Cortex stuff, then there's stuff that's for your specific SOC and for your specific board. So some of the code will be shared, some of it will be if depth. A lot of it's driven from the uh, the configuration files. So if you look at the files at ARM and STD to ARM, it'll it, that basically defines which files will get built for each SOC and for which each board. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.